How Generative AI Will Impact Businesses, Enterprises, Investments. Hello. All right, guys, welcome to the land of ChatGPT. Uh, thanks for being here. So uh, ChatGPT is that little seed that's currently growing, and most people aren't aware of it but it'll have the effect of carrying in your pocket a little seed that eventually grows into a beanstalk from Jack and the Beanstalk. So this is, this is the world we're birthing and it comes with a lot of ramifications and we have for you guys a very able group to chat about some of this. So uh, we'll go into that. My name is Jaden Sage, I run Global Crypto Council as well as I'm closely associated with the AI movement in San Francisco and I'll allow everybody else to give their intros. Valerie? Yeah, good morning, everybody. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I am uh, the head of uh, Center of Excellence dedicated to AI for Sorbonne University. It's one of the largest, uh, or the largest university in France that has uh, a center here in Abu Dhabi. Um, and the idea is to develop AI in this region. It's a, a strategic priority for the region, as you all know. Uh, so we are upskilling uh, people in AI um, and we are also doing research program. Uh, I have another hat, I'm also a GP in a fund that is called uh, True Global Venture uh, that is investing into a new technology, especially blockchain and also AI and we are uh, particularly interesting, uh, interested in what's happening now with uh, generative AI and uh, chat GPT because we believe that's going to change uh, quite a lot of uh, the business environment um, and give the opportunity to create a huge amount of value. Sean? Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sean. We honestly have an awesome panel over here. I'm excited just to debate on, on the topic at hand. Um, I'm the co-founder of Metaverse Architects. If there's one thing I learned, it's why is this he who knows he does not know. So I know far less things. That, so I know far less things than I do know. If that makes sense, or I don't know what most of the stuff. But we have been playing with with GPTs for quite some time as an NPC solution for our Metaverse builds. We wanted to find a way to make our non-player characters feel more alive and give them more context with this thing called a context manager that we built. Um, and then as obviously the, the APIs got better and better from OpenAI's side, we just started playing more and more and now here we are. So I'm excited to just bounce ideas and, and debate on what the future might hold. Last but certainly not least, Brandon. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, very happy to be at the AIBC, the best conference in Dubai for blockchain and AI. Um, I created companies in the past and sold them. Then I got some mind-blowing possession to go and work for corporates. So I ended up the CTO of one of the largest technology companies in aviation for a number of years. Then I got my senses and I set up a company called Aeroband with my co-founder David Galeas Samut, who's sitting here somewhere from Malta. And we're launching a coin this year for aviation. Um, we're looking to rebuild the legacy systems in aviation with a new ecosystem on Web3. So, um, so there's three separate areas within this new sector, and we can uh, address only one of them here. So there's the short term, medium term, and the long term. We'll address the long term first real quickly. The long term is that we're all going to be challenged with a sentient artificial intelligence, removing our dominance from this planet. So that's another conversation. The medium term is how it affects governments and how we run society. The short term, which is why we're here, <laughs> is how we can benefit from uh, the burgeoning overlords that are coming in the sentient space. So uh, along that theme line, um, the, the investment and enterprise world for them, generative AI is, is more along, akin to a steroid shot. Because if you take a reference from, uh, from uh, crypto, we have nodes, right? So each node serves a function. We humans are nodes, um, intellectual nodes. And what we have now is we have a system that collects the data from all the nodes and regurgitates it 
which effectively means it's far more optimized and efficient. Hence, any business that engages in it winds up becoming far more optimized and efficient, and any business that chooses not to engage will be left in the dust. So I would like to hear what your guys' thoughts are on how businesses can benefit and how important it is for them to engage with it. Valerie? Well, I think, uh, I think AI is now completely uh, ubiquitous everywhere. I mean, uh, we, it's, we're already uh, surrounded by, uh, by AI. I mean, uh, ChatGPT is probably the iPhone moment, and uh, suddenly people in the public have realized how important uh, AI is and how it's going to change the world. But uh, businesses have looked into that um, for a long time. I mean, uh, from the academic side, we've done uh, their research projects that are very, uh, very exciting in many, many sectors. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I think the, the, the landscape is going to change and business have to harness uh, that, uh, uh, that strength of, uh, of AI. Otherwise, they will be definitely left behind. Awesome, Sean. Totally. I think a better question is like which industry or which business won't be affected by AI. I think that's more interesting because I, I totally agree with your point about nodes. Like data is everything from my perspective now. And as long as you're dealing with data, we've just discovered a more efficient way to be able to aggregate and predict an output. Um, a way to be able to make ourselves more efficient as long as we're, we're dealing with some form of input and output or prompt and reply. Um, and we have yet to see exactly how that's going to disrupt in the medium term, which, which regards to the status quo and the, the infrastructure we've built and whatnot. But I, I think that that's a really interesting question. What industries are not going to be impacted by this technology? Because I, I do believe they're very scarce and minimal. Thanks, Jaden. Um, fascinating question, the million dollar question, really. I, I guess I'm looking at the panel here. I'm the eldest one, I believe, and I was around to see the birth of the internet. And I think this is the biggest flip point anyone will have lived through to date. This is going to be huge. And I'm not too sure we realize just how big it is. So we've spent decades staying above the, you know, the, the, the high water line of technological automation. Now, with this generalized AI, they're starting to do tasks that two humans do well and do it even better. So the reinvention of the human condition is really the challenge here because there isn't a job on the planet that can't be replicated in some way in due time. So this is really a very philosophical question. It's a very deep question where we went from a world where we had a process where we had AI in the loop. We now go to a world where the process is AI and we're the human in the loop. And we need to define what that role is for the human. It's the million dollar question. It's difficult. And my own personal belief is that what we possess ultimately is consciousness and the ability to create reality for consciousness. And I think this is something the machines will never have. So I think it's a very, very deep philosophical question. Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, uh, to bounce back on this idea, I think, um, I think in, the, in the ethical, I mean, uh, the regulation of AI and ethics committee have been set up to, uh, to manage that aspect that you were mentioning. And uh, there is a consensus that uh, the final decision needs to stay and remain with the human. But uh, the human-machine interaction needs to come from the fact that uh, AI is a tool and is helping uh, the human to take the, the, this decision, this final decision. Uh, how long will we be able to maintain that consensus? That's uh, what we have to work towards too. So, so the bigger thing is, uh, and I'm going to let you go, Sean, on this one, is... Um, how can it help us? We all know the risks. We all know how it's going to affect us. But there's, there are some positives to this because we are reaching our collective limits. We still haven't even figured out how to allocate resources efficiently to each other and the populace. Our democracies tend to be borderline failing. Our systems are uh, borderline failing. So having a collective of our intelligentsia coming together in a, in a digital format facilitates possibly new ways 
to implement things where we're hitting roadblocks. So that's some of the benefits. So while we, we know the negatives, but some of the benefits is it may be able to break through that our own uh, psyche cannot break through and see things from a different perspective. Sort of like an alien showing up on the planet and asking exactly why do you do these things in such a stupid way? And then we can have some introspection. So, Sean, I'd like you to address that a little bit and see how one of the uh, positivity of seeing a new perspective helps industry. Uh, to link this to, for example, the rise of the internet, just, just for the sake of being fair, like you could be very excited by realizing that the world is at your pocket and suddenly you're decentralizing information. But if we were having a conversation on how the internet was going to affect the, the future of, of, let's say, X, Y, or Z, businesses, social interactions, or whatnot, we could say that we're going to be a more connected world, but there was no data for us to be prepared on the fact that now I can send a WhatsApp message to my grandmother with a photo of a cat meme and should completely get it. The point there is that our day-to-day -day interactions with technology are often very organic and it's hard to prepare for that. What I do know is, or what, what I can tangibly state as, as what may be happening, especially after reading Attention is All You Need. If any of you want to learn more about AI, Attention is All You Need is a brilliant paper to start with, just because it really breaks down the architecture of a GPT, and it helps you understand exactly what is going on when it spits out those tokens or when it spits out that output. You have a better appreciation of how algorithmically it just works and predicts, predicts what's coming next. I think that's where the biggest point of value is, being able to understand what's happening under the hood, and then trying to identify different data sets that you can play with to be able to refine or fine tune that, that model to be able to get the output that you desire. And I think that opens so many more doors in the creative process that we did not have access to in the past. And this is something Metaverse Architects uses on a day-to-day -day basis. Honestly, we're so dependent on it today. It, when when ChatGPT is down, when mid-journey is slow, we actually do suffer as a company just because it's allowed us to be so much more competitive, not just in the ideation process, but in the ability to go from the ideation process all the way towards taking our product to market in a far more efficient way. And it just allows us to test so many ideas rigorously in, with a smaller team, with a smaller budget, and just testing so many different avenues as well. And that's something that's happening to us right now and we're severely dependent on and I think it's only going to get more and more important as time goes on. Fair enough. So Brandon, uh, without, without jumping back into the philosophical side of this equation, how do you see this as a, as a medium term step into the future for companies? Because it's going to change out. First you get the data, you, you, you consume the data and you make those changes that we previously addressed. You see a new viewpoint. But after that comes a whole different set of dynamics where we start seeing things with that introspection. How do you think uh, society and business will be impacted after they have that unique perspective? And will it lead to more of a crisis situation? Or will we be brought back to uh, of swift optimization? I think it's going to be a rainbow of events. There will be some fear on one extreme. On other extremes, there's going to be a great deal of enablement and solving really difficult problems that haven't been solved. So I work with a lot of companies in logistics, cargo, maritime, aviation, those kind of areas. Most people in this room will not believe when I say that when you book a ticket on an airline, 49% of all the tickets booked on the planet go through software that was written in the 1960s. 49% still today. And the problem is getting air airlines to collaborate on old systems and to offer a customer solution using optimization and fair uh, divvying up of the, the fare. AI solves that. And this kind of AI leap forward is going to change that. It's going to change the collaboration in global shipping. Global shipping use software that's 30 years old and very broken. And they can't collaborate. They don't know how to write the software to collaborate. Blockchain has laid a foundation that it's possible, but they don't know how to collaborate to, to use a public blockchain. But with AI and blockchain, and you get this concept of a DAO becoming a reality, you now have a governance model in industries that could not govern themselves. And this is a huge leap forward. And I think that's going to be one of the big areas of growth, real working DAOs, not something that's, you know, 
conversational piece, but will change shipping, cargo, multimodal transport, all of those things where we know the source code, we know the rules, and we all sign up to it, and we say, let it do its job. Valerie, do you see um, the distribution of, the, of this technology being unequally represented in the world? So do you see like certain areas garnering more, more of an advantage because of it, or do you see it having an egalitarian effect where previously nations or people who were impacted uh, by not having access to technology will find themselves leaping forward in a positive way? Uh, yes, I think that's a, that's a big question, but I think uh, AI is going to appear um, in many different uh, use and many different applications in life, many different, I mean, you see a lot of startups that have an AI product uh, that do OCR, optical uh, character recognition, all these kind of things, I mean, uh, and... Uh, uh, so other countries or countries that don't have the means perhaps to develop themselves uh, research and uh, to, uh, to dig into uh, AI deeper might uh, still able to use the technology. I think the inequity will come from the fact uh, that uh, it will be on the education side which means that um, countries that will educate their workforce into AI, and uh, there is an expression that uh, is called uh, being above or below algo, so the countries that will be massively invest into educating and upskilling their resources will have ob obviously an advantage compared to the countries that uh, don't deploy that effort. And obviously, emerging countries are probably, in terms of education, always uh, a bit more uh, not, in, um, not as uh, favored as, uh, as um, uh, developed countries. But the question is, the countries that already have advanced industry will further accelerate. So the pace of acceleration keeps everybody accelerating and nobody actually get, gains a foothold in advantage. So do you see a break, breakthrough in that, Sean, Brandon? I mean, this is why we need to open source our tech and share as much information with each other as possible. Else we end up dividing and conquering ourselves to begin with, and then all you need is one player using it wrongly and everything will go astray. So I, I think my generation will be very preoccupied with understanding the importance of data and I genuinely feel like the geopolitical play would be treating data as both an asset and a threat. And I do feel that the youth that come after me will be talking about this to the same degree as we talked about nukes in the 60s. I but just... every tech is like that. Every tech is a, is a double-edged sword. Uh, a knife can cut your meat and it can also cut you. So every tech operates on that. 100%, but I do feel we're at the moment of a possible cognitive renaissance now, where the difference here is that I can't go to my garage and start building a nuclear warhead, but I can go and connect to ChatGPT if I have an internet connection. And that's one thing that I've seen, that it does level the playing field. So as long as we're connecting more people to these technologies, and also open sourcing the, un the under the hood architecture, we're at least hedging that risk towards opportunity risk as opposed to disruptive risk. And that's optimistic, at least. Awesome. So uh, the, the big takeaway is, guys, the most intelligent people in this entire conference are you guys. Congratulate yourself, because you're here. This is the birth of a new industry, and you're in here. With, and everybody else out there is going to have a WTF moment within the next year and see that this is where it's at. So congratulate yourselves. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. OK, we're on to the next one. We're going to talk more about the future of AI, about emerging trends in the sector. And